Now, what I'm going to do, this is going to be a short little mini video that you may come back to many times in your life because it is the fundamental steps for separation of variables. A technique that many of you admitted to having known, some of you admitted to feeling like you mastered, <laughs> but it's a technique that is used Basically, as far as I can tell, if you're going to do a problem analytically in physics, you're going to use separation of variables 80% of the time. 20% of the time, you're going to write down a Green's function. And most of the time, you're going to end up doing something numerically. So <laughs> that's kind of how it breaks down. But it really comes down to a very, this is probably one of the most formulaic things we do in the class. And you really just have to understand the steps. And step one is to assume the problem separates. And what that means is that you can write your solution, and we'll just assume three dimensions in space and one in time, as a product of variables of single, of functions of single variables. This is an assumption we make at the beginning, and we're going to check that it works. Every now and then, on rare occasions, you separate by doing a sum. So the next steps look the same, and it sometimes works for a sum. Very rarely, but sometimes. Now, so that's step one. Step two is to plug in and check that it separates. What does it mean to separate? You should end up with a function of x, a function of y, a function of z. And if you rearrange things, well, let's just leave it all on the same side. And a function of t equals 0. Now, each of these functions, so this one, for instance, will have total derivatives of x, and it will have x, and it might even have nth derivatives of x. And then this will have the same thing for y, for z, and t. So by a function of x, it might have derivatives in it. And usually you get this by plugging in and then dividing by your guess. And it's dividing by the guess. So when I divide by the full function x, y, z, t, in this case, I'm, I divide out the y, z, and t, and all I'm left with is x's. And I end up here dividing out everything but the y's. Here I divide out everything but the z's. And here I divide out everything with the t's. So dividing by u equal to x, y, z, t is often the key step to generate something that looks like this. But you're going to have, and this function, it could be a bunch of terms. And this function could be a bunch of terms. And this function could be a bunch of terms. But you put them all together and you get that. Are we OK with that step? Now comes, I think, the one that often causes students the most trouble. So this expression. can equal 0 if and only if f of x equals a constant. g of y equals a constant. h of z equals a constant. And j of t equals a constant. And so we might write this as k sub x plus k sub y plus k sub z minus lambda equals 0. I put the minus sign in by hand to kind of explicitly show that I've got to make the constants cancel at some point. <laughs> they can't all be positive numbers because that won't add to 0. So I put that in by hand. Often what we end up doing is the time separate from the space. 
And that's the other reason I wrote it this way. Now, if time wasn't one of your variables, if you were solving del squared u equals zero, one of these would have to be the opposite of these. That's how it would work. And what I've now created, so I've created n separate ODEs that I solve. And I've added constants into the problem. And this is one of those things that often causes students trouble. Right? I've arbitrarily added a new constant before I've even integrated. Right? We're used to integrating, and that gives us a constant of integration. But here I've added a constant. And if you look at it closely, I've made them explicitly eigenvalue problems. Right? Now I've added constants that I have to solve for that this has to work out or I don't have a solution. I put a condition on the problem, put a constraint on the problem. I know I will only get a solution if this occurs. So now what I'm trying to do is find out both what the solution is and what these constants might be. And this is the case where the reason this has helped you is almost always this is one where you know the solution. And the boundary conditions plus any physical conditions, for instance, the wave function has to go to 0 at infinity, or um, you know, the wave function has to be finite, or something like that. The function can't uh, diverge. These set the constants that you've put in place. And that is what allows you to go back and generate your solution. So at the end of the day, your constants will disappear. They'll be related to each other, but they will take on values. For instance, they might take on values of 2 pi times integers because you're trying to make something periodic or zero at a boundary. And this, these five steps are what you're doing. The conceptually hard one I find for students is being willing to just throw in an arbitrary constant. And also to look three steps ahead and say, ooh, what's a good constant to put here so I can know the solution? So if this is a second order differential equation that's about to be a harmonic oscillator, let's make my constant minus k squared. Because if I make it minus k squared, then it's easy to solve in terms of k. If I make it k, I'm going to get a complex number and I'm going to have to go back and figure out that, oh wait, it was oscillating and I really should have used k squared. So getting, this is why knowing key equations by heart and recognizing them is so important when doing physics because it makes it faster at picking these constants. So that's what we're going to do. When we're going to do two examples in class, and then you'll do a one in discussion. So that is your separation by variables in a nutshell. We're done. <laughs>